Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining our web workshop today, um, whatever time of day it might be for you where you are. Um, it's our web workshop, um, This Changes Everything, um, with um, many special guests tonight, including um, Naomi Klein um, and other people that are going to do a global show and tell with around Global Divestment Day tonight. Um, and uh, we already know that people are tuning in from all over the world, so welcome to you all. Um, we've got people signing in from Sweden, from Pennsylvania, from Brazil. Um, so welcome to everybody uh, for joining wherever you are. Um, we're, it, this is an interactive workshop, so um, we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, on the topic for today. Um, and the way that you can interact is by, um, by on, the, um, on the page where you should be watching uh, this web, shop, web workshop right now. Underneath there is a chat box where you can ask questions and interact with one another. Um, and we'll be coming to a question and answer session approximately halfway through the web workshop. We'll also be using Twitter and we'll be using the hashtag web workshop, all one word. Um, so you can tweet us and, and write to us there as well. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, we've got people to, to try and help and answer, answer them there online. Um, so um, we've obviously got the Global Divestment Day that's coming up fast. Um, in just over two weeks' time, on the 13th to the 14th of February. And uh, we really need to uh, get organizing for that. Many people have been um, already doing huge work and mobilizing in their local communities. And so we're going to be um, hearing more about that uh, from um, some of our speakers today. And actually, I'm going to pass it over to May Boovey, who is the executive director of 350.org. Um, and she's actually going to share a bit more with us about Global Divestment Day. So over to you, May. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Emma. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be with you. And I'm uh, calling in from New York, where it's about lunchtime. So uh, especially grateful to those of you for whom it's very early or very late. Uh, but I think you've come to the right place because we're going to have a wonderful set of uh, speeches and conversations about what's important about Global Divestment Day. I think if you remember one thing from this call, it's that you really need your help and we hope you'll participate with us. And if you remember one website, it's globaldivestmentday.org. That's where you can sign up for hosting an event or joining an event on February 13th and 14th. And I'll say a little bit about why we think it's important to do so. As most of you know who are tuning into this workshop, the climate crisis is changing everything about the way we live. And it also represents an incredible opportunity to remake the world. But there's one thing that's really big standing in our way. And I think you can probably guess what it is. <laughs> It's the political power that the fossil fuel industry holds. And what the divestment movement has shown is that when people organize, get together, mobilize, we can challenge this industry and we can see new results. In the last year, we saw $50 billion worth of investments uh, divested already, and we're just getting going. There's hundreds of campaigns happening all over the world. And what we're going to demonstrate together on February 13th and 14th is how truly global this movement is, how widespread it is, and how creative it is. That we're not going to stop until we've won. So I hope that all of you will come away from this conversation with more ideas about what you might do, and some more food for thought about why this fight is important. So with that, uh, I'm very excited to introduce Naomi Klein. Um, a great hero of mine, a, uh, the author of the recent Knockout book, This Changes Everything, recently cha uh, translated into many. Um, Naomi is a member of the board of 350.org, a friend, and I'm so glad she's here with us. Welcome, Naomi, for participating in our web chat. 
Thank you, May. I'm so glad to be here. Thank. I'm overwhelmed by the response to this. Um, uh, I don't know how many people. Do we know how many people are are listening? Is it possible to to know that? How many people are out there? We've got uh, over two thousand people joining us. That's yeah. crazy. And and just <laughs> I think um, such a powerful indication of the interest in in this topic. And you know, and as May said. Um, this really is about sending the message that this is everywhere um, because there is I think there's a there's a sort of patchy quality to it there are places where this is very much in the public um, uh, debate um, front of mind front of newspaper um, and there are places where it's really just getting started um, and uh, I think having it having a coordinated day of action is going to send this really really clear message um, that that this is happening all over it's spreading more quickly um, than any movement I've ever witnessed um, and it's just an exciting time so thank you all for being here and um, Let's get started. Cool. So Naomi and I are going to have a conversation uh, for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to hear questions from all of you. So many thanks um, for participating and for the people who are listening on Twitter to your questions. Mm -hmm. um, so my first question, Naomi, is there's a lot of talk right now about the impact that oil prices are having on the economy. It's being written about very widely in the news and obviously an important topic. Can you speak to what role falling oil prices play on energy and climate politics in particular and what we should be thinking about in this moment? Yeah, um, I think it's a great place to, to start the conversation. Um, and um, it's something I've been thinking a lot about uh, because... Uh, uh, the book I wrote before this changes everything is a book called The Shock Doctrine, and that is about how moments of shock, moments of cri crisis, including dramatic changes in the market, like we're seeing right now with oil prices, um, can be catalysts for change. Um, the message of that book is that, that these moments are often uh, uh, catalysts for the wrong kind of change, and I think it's really important to understand in terms of um, low oil prices and climate is that none of this is predetermined. Um, it can, uh, it, 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 it is not preordained that it will either hurt or help uh, the climate movement. And in fact, if we do nothing, um, it's more likely that low oil prices will work against sensible climate action for just for simple economic reasons that when oil is cheap um, people feel able to buy more of it um, and already we're hearing these stories of you know the comeback of the SUV and all of the incentives um, towards efficiency for, for, for reasons of financial strain and stress that people were leaving their cars at home and taking public transit, were carpooling, were doing things that were good for the environment but for financial reasons because oil was so expensive, we've lost that. So we need to understand that that is the context in which we're working. Um, that's not good news. Um, it's, 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 it's bad news. Um, but I think on the whole, um, if we look at it in the landscape of this rising movement um, that we're a part of, uh, if we look at it in the context of the run-up to the Paris negotiations and the fact that climate is going to be very much and is very much in the news um, and, 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 and top of mind, and if we also look at it in the context of what's happening with the renewable energy um, sector and the fact that renewable energy technologies are improving very quickly, prices are, are also dropping in renewable energy, the fact that we can all now point to a country like Germany that has moved so rapidly towards having between 20 and 25 percent of its electricity coming from renewables, um, that this this is definitely a moment. And um, uh, Louise, if you can sh show last week's Economist cover. We have a, a slide here. Um, many of you will have seen it. Um, this is a, a figure, for those of you who can't see it, this is a, a figure leaping off a pyramid of oil barrels. Um, and the headline is Seize the Day. And the uh, editorial that accompanies this article says that we now find ourselves in a, and this is a quote from The Economist, right, not from 350.org, this is a quote from, you know, the conservative economist saying that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to uh, dramatically transform our energy system, to kick the oil habit. I mean, I've, we've been using this slogan internally 
um, kick it while it's down. <laughs> and um, there, there, are, there are various reasons why if we get the right set of incentives in place, both political and economic, um, it can be a really, really good time uh, to get off fossil fuels um, and push very aggressively towards a, uh, a, a decentralized, renewal-based economy. Um, so, so there's a couple of reasons why. I mean, I think what, one of the things that has really struck me, May, um, you know, in the past couple of weeks as I've been thinking about this, this the impact of this, of this price plummet, right? And for those of you who aren't following this as closely, I mean, we have been living with um, oil priced at between 80 and 100 or more dollars a barrel. I mean, even reaching like around $120 a barrel now for um, a, more than a decade. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it went up to $100 a barrel after the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003. That's when things really um, took off. And I wrote a column uh, um, about a year after that, and the headline of that column was um, Baghdad Burns, Calgary Booms. <laughs> it was about the fact that the turmoil in the market that had sent that was linked to the invasion of Iraq that had sent oil prices soaring mm -hmm. was leading to the boom that was happening in the Alberta tar sands. Calgary is ground zero for that, those profits. All money flows through Calgary. Calgary. Um, and um, you know we have always known or known for a very long time that there were huge um, oil deposits in northern Alberta. But those oil deposits were not counted, the vast majority of those oil deposits were not counted towards the global fossil fuel reserves because mm. they were considered uneconomic, right? It wasn't that they didn't know they were there. It wasn't that they discovered oil in Alberta in 2003. It's that when oil was $30 a barrel, $40, $50 a barrel, it didn't make sense to count it because it costs so much to dig it up, right? So I think... What, what's really been striking to me is understanding, well, it really kind of makes sense why, despite all of the consciousness raising that has taken place over this past decade, you know, Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore, the IPCC winning the Nobel Prize, Age of Stupid, like all of these various sort of moments when consciousness has raised around climate change, why that hasn't translated into sustainable action is because we have been working against this, the titanic power mm -hmm. of enormous profit. Um, and that the enormous profit that come with oil at such a high price because that kind of pricing a hundred dollars a barrel it makes people crazy it's irresistible you know um, right. that and so at the same time as we've had scientists raising the alarms you know we've it, we've had we've been barreling down the wrong road we've been barreling into extreme energy drilling in the Arctic tar sands fracking um, and this is all linked to high prices. So we, are, we, we find ourselves with this little kind of reprieve is the way I think we should think about it, right? Because it's not permanent. What goes down can go back up and will go back up. But I think what this has given us is a little bit of breathing room because suddenly these projects that we've all been working so hard to stop, many of them are... Are, are kind of shutting down on their own, right? I mean, not completely, but, you know, investors are pulling out of the tar sands or suspending their investments because it's so expensive. There's less of a push for Arctic drilling. That's a context in which it's easier to win political victories, right? When you're going head-to-head -head with the most powerful and richest companies on Earth and they're dying to get into the Arctic and you're saying, no, you know, that's not a fair fight. But if their, their, their own, you know, investors are going, wow, is this a really good idea? I think that's the moment when we can win some really big victories to close off fossil fuel frontiers. And of course, this is intimately tied to the whole logic of the divestment movement and the need to leave this carbon in the ground. But we all know we're not going to win this, you know, one divestment fight um, at a time. We're going to win this by building um, the arguments that will then lead to big demands like no new fossil fuel frontiers, you know, um, countrywide bans on fracking um, and to closing off the Arctic to drilling permanently, these types of, of, of policies. So um, I think we're in a much better situation to win that, but we need to understand that this is a window. We can't, this is the last moment to be complacent. I mean, when The Economist is calling this a once in a generation opportunity, um, think about that. It means it doesn't come, come uh, around again. So there's that. And then there's also the fact that I think one of the reasons why it's been difficult to, um, to win 
sustained victories to put a price on carbon, you know, a, a, a carbon tax. And I don't think a carbon tax is a silver bullet, but I think a progressively designed carbon tax you know, is part of a slate of policies that we need to, to, for this transition to happen. Um, you know, when consumers are hurting, and we've been in the midst of an economic you know, downturn, recession, crisis, depending on where you live, um, it's hard for politicians to increase the price of energy when consumers are already suffering. So when suddenly oil's way cheaper right. um, and your energy bill's dropping, um, that's a good time to introduce a progressive carbon tax. So between the capacity to, you know, um, to, to, to win some big keep it in the ground uh, uh, fights in the midst of, of uh, falling prices and the ability to fight for a progressive carbon tax um, and the fact that we now have these great examples of what a renewable, uh, rapid renewable transition would look like, I think it is an extraordinary moment, to be honest. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, and that extraordinary moments can pass. So uh, for all of you listening who are wondering, what do I do in this moment? We hope that we'll give you lots of, lots of good ideas throughout the course of this conversation. Yeah, um, I one more thing on that point. They can't... Yeah. They can and do pass, you know. I mean, I, I, you know, some of you have heard me say this before, but you know, I'm haunted um, by the the long shadow of of 2008 when the financial crisis hit and we all witnessed this huge transfer of wealth from public hands um, into the hands of the banks. And this was a moment when there could have been a real leap forward, particularly in the United States. Um, it, it could have been a leap forward because Obama had just been elected. Um, he was elected with a clear democratic mandate to act on climate change. Um, and uh, and he, it, he, it was also a moment when the car companies were bankrupt. It was also a moment when it was possible to write a very big stimulus bill. It was also a moment when you could tell the banks what they should lend to. They could have supported the energy transition. Right. And that became a moment of demobilization for people as they sort of waited for to see what Obama would do. And and I feel like we're being given a second chance. You know, I when that happened, um, and and you know, and we didn't seize that moment, I really felt like I'm not ever gonna see another moment like this with this amount of potential. And here we are now with this opening and we're also seeing some big political shifts. I mean, Syriza just won in Greece. That's a big message. Um, where Podemos is rising in Spain. Um, there are political parties that need vision, and uh, to, to, they need vision for you know what the next economy should look like. And I feel like um, the climate movement should be very much a part of that conversation. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm going to ask another question now. Um, you know, I th I think a little bit about since it's still January, barely. <laughs> we're we're just into the new year. Um, I've been thinking a lot about 2015 as a year when we have to demonstrate irrevocably that the fossil fuel age is over. And if if we think about 2014 as a year that uh, through your book, through our mobilizations collectively around the people's climate marches around the world this idea that climate change changes everything and we need everyone part of the movement, that was sort of the 2014 moment. Here we are in 2015. So how are you, um, how are you thinking about that? What's on your wish list for the climate movement for 2015? You spoke to it a little bit, but um, are there some things where if you could close your eyes and snap your fingers and suddenly it happened, <laughs> what would be taking place? Well, I mean, my personal obsession is, um, you know, I, I feel like there's this way in which we still are failing to break out of our respective issue silos, um, where the people who are, who, who are working um, on climate, you know, that's, that, that, that doesn't intersect nearly enough as the people who are working fighting for the public sphere, fighting for the commons, fighting against austerity. Mm -hmm. And even when those are the same people. They put on their climate hat and they're being one person and then they put on their, you know, no cuts hat or their anti-austerity hat and it somehow doesn't become the same conversation. Even when we intellectually understand it. And um, and I have, m m I have a lot of hope about the fact that uh, the next COP is happening in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that presents enormous opportunities because in Europe, the anti-austerity movement is so strong, um, 
particularly once again in this moment where political parties that are uh, running on anti-austerity agendas are winning elections or, or are poised to win elections. Um, it's a moment where we can bring our movements together and, and, and have one conversation instead of these separate conversations. I'll give you an example of sort of um, you know what I mean. I, I was in um, the, 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 the one European country where I've launched the book in translation um, is the Netherlands um, and, and Belgium uh, as well. And when I was going from Amsterdam to Brussels, there was this whole thing because there was a train strike. And, it was a, and Brussels is getting hit with, uh, Belgium is getting hit with a round of austerity right now. And one of the services that is under threat are the public trains. And so they're having a series of rotating strikes leading up to a general strike. And so the day I was there, there was a, there was a rail strike. And, 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 and all of the climate activists were talking about it as basically a bit of an inconvenience, you know, in terms of getting from A to B. And I was just amazed that, it, that this was not being talked about as part of the climate movement. And May, you and I have talked about this, you know, it's one of the things that we want to do at 350 is really, is, is have the fight for not just affordable, but in my opinion, free public transit, um, you know, be welcomed into the climate movement. And, and you know, when you see people, you know, in the streets of Rio um, and, uh, and Sao Paulo fighting for affordable public transit, it doesn't matter if they call themselves climate activists. They are climate activists because public transit is central to right. any just transition or any transition whatsoever. Um, so that's an example of, of, of what I mean. Is somehow we're not, we're not having the same conversation when, of course, it's the same conversation. This is the world we're fighting for. Um, and, and so I, the, the, my real hope is that... Um, the, the, the labor movement, the, the anti-cuts movement, the climate movement will really come together in a coherent demand for a just transition away from fossil fuels using this price shock as the catalyst because you know I think climate change is never going to be that shock. We think it's going to be. We think if we scare people enough that that will shock them. But in fact, you know, to use the language that um, there's a great group in the, in the Bay Area called Movement Generation that we work with at 350 and are just really amazing thinkers and theorists and they have this this presentation that they do called shock slide shift um, and uh, and and what it's about is you know we've got these sort of punctuated shocks and we also have these long slides um, you know a, a disaster is a shock climate change is a slide and our our mission is to harness the shocks and the slides to win the shift that we want right we're in the slide we've just got a shock okay um, and now we need to fight for the shift and mm -hmm. I feel like it needs to be you know almost simple enough to fit on a postcard like what is it that we're fighting for we're fighting to leave it in the ground um, right. no new fossil fuel frontiers we're fighting for for societies powered by a hundred percent renewable decentralized energy we're fighting for free public transit I would add that um, uh, we're fighting for a principle that the polluter should pay, that it should be, has to be justice-based in how we pay for it. Um, and, and, and also that we're fighting for a principle of front lines first, that the people who have gotten the worst deal in the old economy should be first in line to benefit mm -hmm. um, from the new economy. So some, some, some principles that we can all agree on and rally behind. Um, and um, I think you know, that, that's my hope for 2015, that we get get off the defense and we put forward this very clear vision, bringing all of our movements together um, because they're mobilized in incredible ways. Some of you may have read the piece I wrote try, trying to connect Black Lives Matter with the climate justice movement because so much of what we are fighting for is based on the principle that black lives matter, that all lives matter, um, and the way we are behaving, our, our governments are behaving in the face of the climate uh, crisis actively discounts black and brown lives um, over white lives. It is a actively racist response to climate change that we need to expose and be in dialogue. So I think we should have to not be afraid to bust down these barriers if we really mean it when we say that if we need, are going to change everything, it's going to take everyone. Absolutely. And I think that coupled with what you were saying earlier about this moment I think there's um, there is so much energy um, and alignment happening within all these different movements, and we have a moment, and let's do it. 
I'm, I'm excited. I'm ready. Um, I have one more question, and then we're going to take questions from the, from the chat. So thanks to those of you who've asked questions. Um, we'll get to them shortly. Um, so my last question is, um, as, we, as we move towards the 13th and 14th of February, Global Divestment Day, um, and really think about the next moves on divestment, um, I wanted to ask you about that in particular because you were instrumental in helping articulate the link between stranded assets, unburnable carbon, climate change, and divestment. Um, and the movement to divest has just taken off in incredible ways. And so I'd like to ask you kind of a reflective question. What has been most significant about divestment and what needs to happen next to keep that call fresh and alive yeah. uh, in this moment. Well, if, if I can just, if you can just indulge me a little bit to give you a little bit of kind of history of, from my perspective of where this came from, not ancient history, but um, but the, the, the idea for a, um, a national and then international divestment call on fossil fuels. There was there were already pockets at, at, at certain U.S. universities that were working um, for their schools to divest from coal, um, but there wasn't a fossil fuel divestment call that had been made yet. That call came out of a call between uh, Bill McKibben and I, um, which we had after both of us had read the carbon tracker research. Um, and which blew both of our minds. I mean, that this is the research that all this is based on that shows that the fossil fuel companies have five times more carbon in their proven reserves than the atmosphere can absorb and leave us with a decent shot of keeping temperatures below two degrees Celsius. Now, the thing that was striking when, when, when we were reading that research, right, is that it was not addressed to you guys, okay? It was not addressed to us. This is research that was done for the investment community, okay? So it, it, um, it was addressed to investors mm -hmm. as a warning to them that warning there is a bubble in the market. And, and, and this was a couple years out of the, the housing bubble bursting, and it was a warning to say, okay, um, we, 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 we see another bubble on the horizon. We don't want to have another bubble burst um, that just happened. Um, obviously, these companies cannot burn uh, five times more carbon than the atmosphere can absorb, so these are going to become stranded assets. Now, I read that research and I went, no, <laughs> that's not right. Um, we're the bubble, right? Um, and, and they're planning to, to burn the carbon, and they have made a, a political assessment that when our politicians said that they were going to keep temperatures below two degrees, they were lying. They didn't mean it. It was unbinding as we all know in Copenhagen, and Exxon and Shell and everybody else decided that that was not something they had to worry about and that they were going to go ahead and burn it anyway. So I didn't think this was a warning to investors. I thought that this was a warning for all of us, and that's what Bill thought too. So that, then the question is, okay, um, if we're the bubble, you know, how do, we, how, how do we flip it? You know, how do we turn them into a bubble instead of us being the bubble that's going to burst? Um, and... Um, and that's where the divestment idea comes from, right? And those are the stakes. I mean, this is really what that research shows. It all comes back to that research, that it's them or us. Um, and what was so striking, you know, I, Bill wrote that incredible piece for Rolling Stone that popularized this idea of just laying it out because people get these numbers. And Bill is just the most incredible, um, you know, sort of patient explainer, just such a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And um, and people got it. And uh, I had just had my 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 kid at this point, so I wasn't able to go on the on the full fossil free tour that Bill and 350 kicked off. But I did go to New York and Boston, which were a couple of the biggest events, um, with my five month old in tow. And um, and what was amazing was that people were on their feet before we said a word. Um, I've never seen anything like this. It was that people. The, the movement had been waiting for somebody to admit that there was a war going on. And, you know, this comes back to something else that, you know, I go into, you know, one of the more controversial parts of, of this Changes Everything is, is, is the part of the book about how many of the big green groups have partnered with fossil fuel companies on this sort of false idea that we're all in this together. No, we're not, okay? Um, and I think people really get this and young people get this most of all. Um, so 
I think that the, the, it all comes back to that research. Every time you explain it to somebody else, you are part of the solution um, because these mm -hmm. are illegitimate profits. Um, and so, yes, this is about winning victories at your school. Um, it's about winning victories at your church and synagogue, um, at, you know, in your city council. We have to win. I mean, that matters. It, 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 it builds the momentum. Coming back to the other thing about low, low prices, May, that I didn't mention. I mean, the other thing that, that, that helps is that um, fossil fuel stocks are not performing very well right now. So your opponents have just lost their best argument, okay? Right. They won't lose it for long, so that's another reason to just pound away at this because, mm -hmm. you know, if this was last year, they're saying, well, these stocks are performing better than other ones. You want to bankrupt our schools. No. Um, in fact, right. they're underperforming, and so they're not only destroying uh, the planet, but they're also um, taking unnecessary risks with their endowments. So... Um, so, but, you know, another point that I would just say, and this comes back to the, the issue around carbon pricing um, and so on, is that when you make the argument that these, this is a rogue sector, you know, that their business model is at war with life on Earth, um, we are creating a, a, an intellectual space and a political space where it becomes much easier to tax those profits um, and even to, you know, to increase royalties. And if there's too much resistance even to talk about nationalizing these companies. Mm -hmm. um, as if it, it, this is not just about um, the fact that we want to um, separate ourselves from these companies. Um, it's also that if, you know, it, it's, it's that we have a right to those profits. If those profits are so illegitimate that Harvard shouldn't be invested in them, then they are also so illegitimate that then taxpayers have a right to a much larger portion of them to pay for the transition uh, away from fossil fuels and to pay the bills for a crisis created um, by the sector. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so it's not just about disassociating ourselves from their profits, but potentially, um, you know, actually getting a much larger piece of them. Yeah. Well, thanks for. Uh addressing those questions that I had. Um, we've done some looking around for questions that are that have come from all of you listening. Um, so I'm going to be asking some of those questions now. So shall we? Yes, and I'll okay. be. Um, so uh, the first question um, starts with thanking you for speaking with us, Naomi. And then the question, um, and I know you'll have lots to say about this, where do we put our divested funds? How can we push local uh, local economy investment in the transition? And should yeah. I give you should I, should I give you more than one question or just one at a time? Um, I, I'm going to start being m more brief. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, the the reinvestment piece, and I think the reason why it's a little bit um, trickier than than the, than the divestment uh, call is that. What we need to get out of is really simple, right? We need to get, we need to divest from the fossil fuel companies. What we want to in, invest in, I think, will look different everywhere we live. So there isn't going to be one blanket investment answer, nor should there be, because I don't think that this, that 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 the response should be, you know, um, goodbye, you know, big carbon hello, you know, big wind, big solar, right? I think we can do better than that, which isn't to say that, you know, big green companies um, you know, don't have a place in the transition. I think they do, but I also think that we should be looking at supporting, you know, local solar co-ops, um, that we should be looking, this should be very much a tool for climate justice. Um, and, you know, the answer for what that means is going to be something that's only going to come from um, building alliances with frontline communities in all of your communities and finding and developing uh, tools and projects that can be supported and, and, and are being prioritized. Um, you know, we, the Our Power campaign in the United States is a great example of identifying six climate justice communities that have great, that have great transition um, plans, proposals, or some of them already quite far along, um, that can be supported. Um, but that's just in the United States, so it's going to look differently wherever you are. But I do think that we should resist the tempta temptation of just presenting this as a as flipping the switch from, you know, um, dirty energy to big, clean, green energy, um, which will be controlled by a different set of huge corporations. 
I realize it's tempting, and you know, I'm, that, that some people may disagree with me on that. That's okay too. <laughs> um, and thank that last question was from the Twitter handle C A B A U S. So if that was you, that was your question. Want to make sure everybody knows. Um, next question is from Manchester Friends of the Earth F O E or not Friends of the Earth. Uh, not sure. Question from Eileen, who says she's age 93, um, in Manchester, UK. Of all the really urgent environmental issues you outline in your book that we could campaign on, which do you think we should prioritize? Yeah, I mean, I once again, I would say that that is um, really dependent on where you live. That anyone who would pretend that there's one answer to that um, to that question is um, you know, I, I think leading us down the wrong path. And and you know, one of the things that I write about in the book is that I think for too long the um, the climate movement has has adopted the astronaut's eye view of the Earth, um, and and this this sort of um, uh, uh, the you know the, the the icon of the globe as seen from space being the unofficial logo of the green movement has been something of a problem because when you're looking down at the Earth from space things get very blurry and then you can say well there's one solution we would we should all just be fighting um, you know on a very sort of narrow definition of climate action it's only about parts per million um, and you know what we found at 350 I mean we are an organization that's named after the you know parts per million um, you know we are about carbon um, but this movement is powered as we have found by people fighting for the places they love um, and and people it's, it's a movement that's um, that is not driven by hatred of fossil fuel companies more than anything. It's driven by love of place, um, by um, a, 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 a duty and responsibility to protect um, the land and particularly the water for future generations. Um, and so, the, the, so whatever that issue is, it's going to look differently. You know, if, if there's fracking in your backyard, and that's certainly um, an active issue where you live um, uh, near Manchester. I, I think probably it's fracking, especially considering what the British government is doing. But that doesn't mean right. it's fracking everywhere. Right. Although they would like to frack everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not fracking fights for us everywhere. <laughs> um, third question here is from Ian Middleton. Ian asks, we've been here before though, haven't we? What's to stop reversion to business as usual once the price of oil rises again? Yeah, I mean we have we have been here before. Um, you know, we have never been exactly here before um, in the sense of this the, the, this sort of particular confluence of of, of events with um, with the price of of renewables dropping, with the German transition, and also with our movement being where it is. I mean, the climate movement of today is not Al Gore's climate movement. Um, it is a much more uh, grassroots movement, a much more youth-led movement. Uh, um, it, it is, a, I think, a movement that's a lot clearer on what it is fighting for and who it is fighting against. Mm -hmm. um, but I am by no means saying that this shock alone, and this price shock is going to do this for us. It's a question of what we do in this window. And once you get a few of these policies in, in place, so it's really about just taking advantage of the fact that it's a little bit easier to get some big wins right now. It's a little bit easier to win a carbon tax right now. It's a little bit easier to win some leave it in the ground fights right now. It's a little bit easier to fight for visionary policies right now that then have their own momentum, right? I mean, this is the thing about Germany is that once you once you have proof of concept, once people are experiencing it, then they start fighting to protect it, right? Then they want more of it. Um, so it isn't saying, well, the market is going to do this for us. It's that we have a very brief moment where a few market forces are working in our favor. It will not last. It will not do it for us. But we need to use this moment to push for policies that can then create a context where people are fighting to protect policies that work. Because our problem is that we haven't been able to get the policies in place in the first place. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm feeling the urgency. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know what? Climate change doesn't that. always suffer for lack of urgency, and yet there is more. <laughs> um, so here's a here's a specific campaign question. Um, this was anonymous, um, but question is: 
what do you think the likelihood is that Pope Francis will divest the Vatican and call on all Catholics to divest? Hmm. Um, you know, that guy's full of surprises. That's all I can say. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think it's great to keep the pressure up. Um, my book just came out in Italian, and I'm going to Italy on, on uh, next week. I'm going to be spending the, the week there, and um, I'll be pounding away. And oh, good. I all, all of you will, too. <laughs> you can drop by the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. Good. Um, so I guess we don't know, but uh, we're going to be pushing for it for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, but I do think that, that, that um, you know, I think that raises, you know, a slightly different point. You know, I've been making these arguments around economics, um, and I think they are important, but, it, but there is nothing more powerful than a values-based argument, right? I mean, we're not going to win this as bean counters. We're not going to beat the bean counters at their own game. We are going to win this because this is an issue of values, human rights, right and wrong. Um, we just have a brief period where we happen to also be able to have some nice stats that we can wield, but, let, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that what actually moves people's hearts um, are, are the arguments based on, on the value of life. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to pause this part, actually. So um, thank you so much, Naomi. And um, I'm feeling more inspired to think about this moment and um, work with all of you who are listening in towards making the 13th and 14th um, as important as it can be, given, given the window that we're working within. Um, and one more point that I need to say is that uh, other questions that didn't get answered will be responding to via Twitter. Um, so if you're if you're wondering about that, stay tuned. Um, and so from here, I'll pass it back over to Emma, and we're going to do a global tour of what's uh, what's coming together for Global Divestment Day. So thanks again, Naomi. The, the, global, the global digital audience is applauding. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, May. I'm going to stay for the tour, but 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 I'll see you see the rest of you on Twitter. Great. Take it away, Emma. Thanks so much, both of you. Um, and you can follow Naomi on Twitter as well, at Naomi A. Klein, and also at This Changes to keep up the conversation on the hashtag web workshop. Um, thanks so much for your conversation. Um, and as May says, we're going to now have a, a tour around the world to hear from um, different people who have been involved in organizing and supporting other people who are organizing for the Global Divestment Day. Um, and so we're going to kick off in Melbourne, Australia with Charlie Wood. Um, and she's going to uh, chat to us for three minutes about what's happening over her part of the world for the Global Divestment Day. Great, thanks so much everybody. Um, and it's fairly early here, so I'll try and be coherent and also uh, short and sweet. Um, we're really excited about Global Divestment Day. It's actually our third divestment day over here in Australia. We had um, two last year, um, and we're really excited to be joining up with the rest of the world um, for this third day. And I think in Australia, there's a particularly um, strong rallying call and focus for, for this um, upcoming day. Um, as folks might have heard overseas, there's plans underway at the moment to build the world's largest coal port on the Great Barrier Reef up in the northern part of Australia. And um, I'm hoping that I can share an image with you um, of what that um, port looks like. So I'm just going to bring it up. Oh, no. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's up on the Great Barrier Reef um, and a number of um, companies uh, and our government at the moment are, are working to move those plans ahead. Um, our federal government is due to approve um, the expansion in three weeks time and it will be a gateway to unlocking nine mega coal mines up in the northern part of Australia which would burn through around 6% of the global carbon budget. So this is significant internationally and in Australia it would triple our emissions and double our coal exports. Um, there's a number of companies that are looking to support that including a number of major international banks and Australian banks and so 
when we um, head into uh, February in the 13th and 14th, that's going to be a really major push for what we're doing here in Australia, which will be calling on um, companies and particularly our big banks here in Australia to say no to these projects. And we've seen over the past 12 months um, thousands of Australians move their money out of the banks who are funding um, fossil fuels and projects like these. Um, last year uh, we had, I'm going to try and show another picture um, from one of our last Global Divestment Days, um, people hit the streets and line up in queues um, in front of bank branches around the country and shut down their accounts and divest um, from these banks. And we'll be asking them to, to do that again um, on February 13th and 14th. We'll be um, turning out with large colourful rallies um, in capital cities around the country. We'll be having um, flash mobs and um, drill rig installations um, and Tina Arena look like um, divest uh, <laughs> song contests um, and all manner of creative things to really um, take this message uh, to the banks and to other companies that are funding um, fossil fuel expansion and climate devastation in Australia and, and around the world. And so it's really exciting to hear from um, everyone on the panel today about what's being planned around the world and to join in force with you guys um, to fight back these really damaging projects because I think as Naomi and May said before, um, it's through a people-powered movement that we're, we're going to do this and I do have faith that we're going to do this. We have this amazing opportunity right now. Um, and in the lead up to Paris um, to take it to the industry to hit them where it hurts and, and to build um, this people powered movement for a just transition um, to clean, safe and just renewable energy. Fabulous. Thanks so much Charlie. Um, you were you were managed to share so much in such a brief amount of time. Um, so um, we're just going to now move on to um, head eastwards towards um, Taipei in Taiwan. Um, we've got Liang Yi Chang who's going to um, share more from his region. Yes, everyone. I'm Tom here from the really midnight. So you are joining this thing here at 2 a.m. like to 3 a.m. at the moment midnight. And it's, um, but I'm really excited to join this call and with all of you to talk about divestment. So as you know, it's really uh, to the region, and I'm going to show a few slides that we are working on, and hope you can uh, take a look. Let's get started. And yeah, we are really a diverse region, and we hope that we uh, can introduce some experience that we're working in the beginning of 2015 this year. So uh, just two weeks ago, in the middle of uh, January, that uh, Pope Francis visited the Philippines in the region. So uh, we had a call for a fossil free Vatican and we're going to have some slide uh, talking about our actions two weeks ago. And on the arrival of the Pope Francis, we, we do some vigils and holding down candles to welcome him and want to talk to him about um, the uh, super typhoons uh, strike the country and also the region uh, want to divest and uh, we combine a local message and the climate groups together and also the votes even uh, to call for uh, divestment in the region. And the people who suffering from the extreme weather, the super typhoon Haiyan, uh, also had a really well come from the ground, ground zero with the Papao visit. So um, our experience is that it's quite new to the region, but we're also really excited and people are willing to join this uh, fight with all of us and to push this forward even that we're uh, having some developing countries in the region and also uh, want to push this forward to align the local campaigns. So while the lab of the um, uh, Popal visit of the Philippines, we also had the chance from the bishops uh, partner with to hand in a letter talking about fossil free and then to call for climate justice uh, to, to uh, the wider regions. And for preparation for the Global Divestment Day, we're also uh, preparing a lot for the region and ongoing flight. The Papao might visit uh, again to the region next year, so we are having a long-term uh, strategy campaign on that. And also, and around the region, uh, we're doing a lot in, in February 20, uh, 13th and 14th. 
including Japan, we're having a symposium and creative actions. And in Paul, we're having the umbrella rally and the CD center. And also Vietnam, we're having several actions and banners holding. And Indonesia, we're calling for diverse coal issues in the country. And Bangladesh, Thailand, Malaysia, we're calling for a new energy and then calling our president leaders and climate leaders to do the actions and to spread the divestment campaign in the region. So the last thing is want to celebrate this uh, special moment and want everyone up here to divest with us. Thanks so much, Liangyi. Um, and I think you probably uh, answered that, that question that was um, asked from, uh, from the public about whether uh, we're going to be successful in getting the post to divest the Vatican. I think with the way that the campaigning's been going, um, uh, where you've been locally, um, there's been pressure been ramping up, and uh, I think there's a good chance for success uh, if we keep pushing. Um, we don't know unless we try. Um, so, um, thanks so much. We're going to move east again, um, and we're going to speak to Olivia Lenanda, who um, is based in Gothenburg in Sweden. Thank you, Emma. And this is so inspiring. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm also going to be showing a few slides from the European region where we also have lots of uh, fun plans um, for Global Divestment Day. Um, first of all, last week um, there was quite a lot of momentum building. I'm going to share my screen um, to show some slides. Um, First of all, we had we had two universities divest last week in Europe. Um, first, that was Bedfordshire University, um, who in its in their new ethical investment policy banned the fossil fuel sector from the university's investments. And uh, just a couple of days later, we announced the first Swedish university divesting from fossil fuels, which was the Chalmers University of Technology. Um, and I'd actually like to share with you a quote from uh, Jon Holmberg, their, um, their uh, vice president, um, and which is uh, that uh, what he was saying is when the apartheid regime fell in South Africa, universities were part of driving that change by divesting and thus removing their support from companies operating in South Africa. So investments can be a key factor for change. This we know. Um, and this is something that the University Chalmers and also uh, Bedfordshire showed last uh, last week. Um, and for uh, for Global Divestment Day, we have several large events being planned all around Europe. Um, five big events in London, Paris, um, Berlin, Amsterdam, and Stockholm. Um, and I'd like to share with you um, some highlights from there, uh, from our plans. Um, first out is Amsterdam. Um, in Amsterdam, the plan is to um, people will use their bikes to surround the Amsterdam Municipality City Hall, which is the biggest uh, building in the city of Amsterdam. And when they've surrounded the city hall, they're going to sound sirens, bells, drums, whistles, pots and pans to surround, sound the alarm about the dirty, risky investments in fossil fuels that the city is making. Um, and I'd also like to share with you the fact that this nice image um, of a bike demonstration is from the 70s um, when there were large bicycle mobilizations in Amsterdam for bicycle infrastructure. Um, so it's really fun to see how these um, traditions of mobilizing are being used for Global Divestment Day also to call for divestment. In uh, Berlin, we're seeing the Fossil Free Berlin group also doing something really creative. Um, in a flash mob, they're going to wash the city's money clean against the backdrop of the world clock on the iconic Alexanderplatz, urging the Senate of Berlin to pull out of fossil fuels. So here we see also a really fun flash mob um, where they're going to wash the city's money clean. Um, and finally, I'll share with you a third 
event that's being planned in Stockholm, which is the capital of Sweden, um, in an artistic performance outside the Stockholm City Hall. Fossil fuels uh, that have invaded the, the city council will be chased away by hundreds of people um, in a creative call out for Stockholm to divest. Um, yeah, so uh, we're seeing lots of creative different call outs for divestment. And um, that's all I had to share with you guys. Um, gonna looking forward to hear the rest of the updates from North America. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Um, it's great to hear uh, the inspiring stories um, that just showing that history, what's happened, and um, through history, that our tactics can work, um, and how they've been successful. And so um, it also means that. Um, we're already creating change with, with the actions that we're organizing and it's great to hear about the ones that that uh, people are leading on in Europe. Um, so um, we're going to head over to Johannesburg in South Africa and Nicola King is going to share some news from your side of the world now. Well, good evening, good afternoon and good morning to everybody joining us from all around the world. The 350 Africa and Arab World team would like to wish you a very warm welcome. I'm actually sitting here with all the 350 um, team members from Africa. We're all based on the Johannesburg team. You may ask at this stage, why is 350 looking at the Africa and Arab World region? And I'm just going to pop this up here for you to have a look at. So what we're seeing at the moment is that there are a number of news headlines which are continuing to recognize the issues around climate change and particular fossil fuels. Uh, a lot of the countries in the region are actually facing an energy crisis. Some of the headlines paint towards sustainability, good sound environmental practices, and then of course the issues around divestment. The key issue in South, South Africa in particular and for this region is that the South African Nobel laureate Desmond Tutu has backed a boycott on fossil fuels and he has stated that people of conscience must break ties with oil and gas companies that are destroying the planet's future. Following on from this, 350 Africa and 350 Arab World have established a regional vision where we'd like to establish a thriving and resilient region where people live harmoniously in a clean and safe environment powered by renewable energy. We have a regional divestment goal following on from this, where by 2020 we would like to receive commitments from the region to stop the future production of energy from fossil fuels. And the first year of focus for this will be looking at mobilization and growth of the divestment movement, looking at getting banks in the region to disclose their investments and potentially stop future investment in fossil fuels, as well as mobilizing universities and faith-based organizations around divestment. Our fossil free campaign for Africa was launched in 2014, so it's very new, only three months old. It started with a protest outside one of the South African banks, which is regarded as a green bank, and these are some pictures around that. It then also launched a YouTube clip called You Green, which was based almost as a spoof on one of the, the bank's adverts. This clip is actually available on our 350 Africa YouTube website. So that was the start of the campaign. And now, as May mentioned earlier, the focus is on Global Divestment Day. And for Global Divestment Day in Africa, and South Africa in particular, we're looking at mobilization through artivism with film, music, performance art, and visual media. The aim of the day specifically is to create awareness around 350.org and also the Fossil Free Africa campaign as well as divestment. In terms of that, we seem to have a problem with the, uh, I'm just going to delete, oops, sorry, we just seem to have a problem with the clip there. In terms of that day, we have established a very good relationship with a group of performance artists to focus on mime. You can see some of the pictures of them down in the left-hand corner of the, of the PowerPoint presentation here. And they really specialize in developing impactful public space interventions. So we're working with them on the day, working with a, 
um, an organization or a, a company called The Bioscope. This is actually a leading independent cinema in Johannesburg. It has a diverse program of independent film work and is a regular supporter of very important films dealing with social commentary. And we're looking at, at showing a environmentally controversial film there that is um, world recognized and we're busy negotiating to get that screened. We have then also um, been fortunate enough to collaborate with a group, a group of artists or, or artivists if you want to call them. Um, they are called the Bantu Continua Ururu Consciousness, Consciousness Band. They have a radical social consciousness and they're a seven piece band from Soweto. So they will also be playing on the night um, and so we hope people will be able to come and enjoy their music, enjoy the movie and sign up and get involved with the movement. In broader Africa and the Arab world we have an event taking place in Burkina Faso. Um, here we have a citizens gathering which is aiming at focusing on public investments in fossil fuels. In Benin we have a workshop for local NGOs and community youth groups and students, um, basically bringing the issues towards them around the importance of divestment. And in Nigeria, a coalition of NGOs, CBOs and FBOs are planning to raise awareness around the impacts on communities and frontline communities facing the effects of fossil fuel burning. And they want to then start looking at large scale advocacy against fossil fuel development. I've mentioned some of the work that's happening in South Africa. And then we also have events or actions registered in Egypt, Israel, and Oman. If you would like any more information on the work taking place in this broad region, please have a look at um, either our web websites, our Facebook pages, or Twitter. And while you contemplate and have a look at that, I am just going to play you out with a little bit of a music clip from BCUC and so you can you can hear what they're all about thank you so much Nicola um, it's so great to hear about the wide variety of people that you're um, you're collaborating with um, for Global Divestment Day um, and that you've got all your creative juices going. Um, thanks so much for sharing. Um, so we're going to go to our last speaker, um, uh, Katie McChesney, who's going to be, um, who's based in Philadelphia in the USA. Um, and yeah, she's going to share some news from North America. Great. Thank you, Emma and everyone. It's, <laughs> it's an impressive task to close out this amazing panel of action and uh, calls to action from across the world. Um, but I know here in North America, we're also very excited about the Global Divestment Day. Um, this is also one of a few that we've taken on, um, but I think this will be our largest. Currently, we have over 60 events in North America with new events rolling in every day and a broad diversity of organizers from Utah to benefit concerts in Missouri to rallies in Alaska. Um, we're really making this day about owning the financial argument and using this as not just a day of action, but a launch pad for more action this spring and bold action into the new year. Um, to give some key highlights of things to expect, <laughs> students in the US from Swarthmore to the University of Colorado Boulder are using the Global Divestment Day as a place to announce plans to escalate on campus this spring. They'll be dropping banners, calling out whose side are you on, clearly naming boards and administrators who have ties to the fossil fuel industry and Wall Street that is funding fossil fuel infrastructure, um, and clearly demonstrating who stands with the movement, the power that they've built on campuses and key movement leaders around the world. Um, they're also launching a Bank on Us pledge, asking students across the region to take nonviolent direct action on campus this spring um, and to do bigger and bolder, riskier action. Other student actions across the region from 
Canada to the southeast, students will be using this day to launch new campaigns and deliver rejection denied messages like at Duke University in the southeast. Um, I think we'll see close to 30 to 40 actions across the whole region just on college campuses alone. Um, but that's not to say that the community events won't be big and beautiful as well. In cities like Toronto, Boston, and Virginia, DC and New York, local groups are partner partnering with college students and high school students um, and a variety of stakeholders. In some cases, spelling out the fo fossil fuel industry's equal history. Actions in Canada will be creative and bold and send a clear message. Don't bank on the tar sands. California alone will have a range of actions. One notable action is a public demonstration in front of the largest pension fund in the nation, one of California's pension funds, turning the spotlight on the public pension fight in the state of California. I think that kind of wraps up the range of actions, but I invite you all to check out the beautiful map um, to revisit some of the stories, not just across North America, um, but also the beautiful events that were highlighted from the other panelists as well. Thanks, Katie. Um, it's great to hear that wide range of types of actions that are happening and how different people are using the Global Divestment Day as an opportunity either to really escalate existing campaigns that they've been running for a while, but also knowing that um, in other places uh, the, um, the divestment campaign is still new for people and they're using it as a chance to, to kick something off. Um, so it's great to hear about the, the wide range that people are using this day to come together um, at whatever stage they are in their campaigns. Um, and all these um, actions that people have mentioned, you can find them on the globaldivestmentday.org website where you can sign up um, and uh, get involved in something that might already be organized or of course um, it's the perfect opportunity for you to uh, take, um, uh, take leadership and sign up your own action and give it a go um, or uh, even if you're a seasoned campaigner um, show what you can do um, and show what together collectively we can achieve um, and what, we, what, we, what we're fighting for. Um, so before I do some final announcements and wrap, wrapping up, um, I think Naomi just wanted to come back in with um, a few other thoughts. Um, so Naomi, um, yeah, over to you to help wrap up this session. All right, am I good? I'm muted. Um, so that was amazing and so inspiring um, and uh, and and dizzying. This is going to be a this is just going to be a fantastic day. It's going to send such a powerful message. Um, I was struck that this um, this movement is led by so many amazing young people, um, and that so many of you are women. So many of the leaders are women, um, and that's something that I want to thank you for and honor you for. Um, and, and, you know, it reminded me of something important, which is I talked a little bit about um, how important it is for us to break out of our silos. And I, we actually have an opportunity to do that on, uh, on February 13th and 14th, because February 14th has a long history as a day of action on violence against women. Um, it is a day that... Um, that V-Day has been organizing around uh, with One Billion Rising, and they've got a big push, One Billion Rising Revolution this year. And in Canada, for 20 years, Indigenous women have um, been leading a memorial march um, uh, marking the lives of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, and uh, I think the first thing to, to do is make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes, organizing events um, simultaneously, but the other thing to do is show up for one another um, because that's the way you build a cross-sectoral movement. Um, and so find out what's going on in your area and do whatever you can to break those silos. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to say, because uh, I was kicking myself um, uh, when May asked about where this is going and, and what we should be looking towards in 2015. We need to divest our universities, our city councils, um, 
but we also need to divest politics from fossil fuel money. And this is what um, the work you're all doing in, um, you know, f fossil fuels are already toxic, but the work you are doing is making them toxic from a PR perspective. Um, and that is translatable uh, to the political sphere. It will and should become politically toxic for politicians to take fossil fuel money. And we do know that this is a tremendous barrier uh, to, the, to the work that, w that needs to happen. Um, we also need to be talking about this in the context of the COP in Paris. Um, you know, part of what we need to be doing in 2015 is exposing the outrageous role of polluters in the UN process. Um, and the UN needs to divest, not just play lip service to divestment. They actually need uh, not to let the polluters make policy on climate change. Um, so those are just a couple of uh, final uh, thoughts I wanted to leave you with. And thank you again for inspiring me and for all the incredible work that you're doing. Good luck. Thanks so much, Naomi. And um, as someone who's based in Paris, um, I'm really feeling how the movement is really picking up speed um, and really um, stepping up to the to the challenge. And um, so, really, thank you for for mentioning that um, because we know that we're we need to be fighting towards Paris and also beyond. And and this is. I think that's also part of it is that Global Divestment Day isn't just an opportunity to take action, it's, or it's also an opportunity for our movement to build and to grow and to connect with the wide varieties of issues um, that we're facing today. Um, so thank you for, for, for sharing those, those other opportunities that are right here on the table for us. Um, so um, yeah, thank you so much to everybody um, for having joined this evening or this morning or this afternoon, um, both our panelists and um, from uh, people who have signed in from across the world. Um, just to let you know, we um, this is part of a series of web workshops. Um, and you can, on, on the page that you'll be watching this from, you'll see um, other ones that have happened that will be helpful to you um, for your organizing for the Global Divestment Day or for other things that you might be organizing. Um, so maybe check out um, if they're useful for you. And also the next one is happening next Wednesday, um, the same time, and is going to be focusing on communications. So just thinking about um, how to get the, the word out about your action, um, who to be in contact with, how can you use social media um, to promote your event um, and recruit people to, to come along and help share the story um, that we're building collectively. Um, we'll also tomorrow be, be sharing, um, uh, doing a follow-up email um, to share this recording um, and also uh, send you a feedback form. So if you've got anything that you want to share with us, um, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, and just as a reminder, um, uh, globaldivestmentday.org is where you can find uh, the beautiful map with the ever-increasing number of events um, that are being registered. Um, uh, we're getting up into the 200 mark, um, and we can take that further. Um, that's a beautiful number, but we can make it more beautiful. Um, so, uh, so don't, don't, um, don't, uh, don't hesitate to um, sign up your event, even if you've just got um, the inklings of an idea, get it up there, you'll no doubt find other people who will want to organize with you and come along. Um, and as we said, people are still going to be on Twitter after this. Um, uh, Naomi um, and her, um, um, the, this changes, this changes um, and Naomi A. Klein. If you search for those um, and follow the hashtag web workshop, um, the conversation will continue. And lastly, we're going to finish with um, the Global Divestment Day video. Um, so just take a couple of minutes to, to check that out. And please do share um, as it, it shows the story um, of what we're trying to build towards and, and why it's so important. Um, so thank you so much again to everyone for joining. Um, I've been hugely inspired, and I'm so excited to see about um, to see what we're going to be uh, pulling out um, on the 13th and 14th um, of February. And have a good rest of your days and evenings and nights. Bye, everyone.
Bye. Bye. Yet, despite undeniable proof that they're fueling a climate crisis, the fossil fuel industry is plowing on with its mission to find more. These companies, with all their financial might, are the biggest obstacle to climate progress. They have our political process in shackles, with their lobbying power, their arm bending of politicians, and their spreading of false information. And they are enjoying billions in government subsidies every year. Fossil fuel companies only care about one thing, money, and their ability to keep making it. What can we do about this? Safe future, powered by clean, renewable energy. Well, you can. You, and me, and her, and them, and those guys, and that group over there, and their friends, and them. They might have, but we have a different currency. It's us, our movement, and we can hit them where it hurts. Since 2012, thousands of respected institutions, local governments, and individuals have pledged to divest from fossil fuels. It's the fastest growing divestment movement in history. Divestment is deliberately moving your money away from companies you're not happy with. It's helped to stop some of history's worst offenders, including apartheid South Africa. Each act of divestment takes back power from the fossil fuel industry and helps create a mandate for our leaders to take real climate action. Last September, hundreds of thousands of us took to the streets to demand action. And now is the time you can join us again. On February the 13th and 14th, 2015, in the run-up to crucial climate talks in Paris, we're holding our first global divestment day, where thousands of people everywhere will turn out to take a collective stand demanding institutions finally do what is necessary to protect our future on this planet. We'll close our accounts with banks and funds who continue to invest in climate chaos. Faith groups, students and frontline communities affected by climate impacts all over the world will get involved. We'll hold divestment flash mobs, vigils, sit-ins, meetings and rallies and we'll get the right information out there. We'll be asking people and institutions everywhere to divest from this self-serving industry of the past. Clean, just, renewable energy technologies will ensure a safe future and they're ready and waiting for our investment. On Global Divestment Day, we will show fossil fuel companies that we are truly a force to be reckoned with and that we're taking back our future. Together, let's make fossil fuels history.